morning, everybody. Is that on? Yeah. Um, I'm short, so all you'll see is my head. <laughs> That's a hard act to follow, and I'm not even going to try. Um, all I'm doing this morning is uh, you know, contributing to the topic, which is um, the blackfish effect. And uh, I'm going to summarize a paper that my husband and I, uh, he's also a marine mammal biologist, uh, my husband and I put together in, um, th with the intention of offering uh, all of the examples of all of the impacts that Blackfish has had uh, in one place, in one citable place in a peer-reviewed um, social science journal, Tourism in the Marine Environment. And that paper is, in fact, pretty much ready to go. It was announced in April, and some of you have seen that announcement and thought the paper was available, and it wasn't yet. So we just sent the proofs back, and it will be open access. So just keep your eye out on social media, and that link will be published probably within the month, because we just sent the proofs back. So um, once it's up, it'll be open access. You won't have to pay for it. And again, it's just a useful tool. Um, it isn't you know, profound <laughs> the way Michael's talk was. It was. Michael's talk, I think, is at the heart of everything that we're doing here. Um, this is just a, a meant to be a practical tool. And I also just wanted to say, one, I haven't actually practiced this talk, so, um, you know, who knows, I might miss things, or if I start running over time, don't hesitate to cut me off because the paper will be available publicly. Um, and secondly, um, I just wanted to say uh, one thing about um, this issue of what drives people to do the things they do and immortality projects and so on. I don't think any of us should be doing what we're doing because we want our lives to matter. I find that very selfish. I mean, I, my life doesn't matter, you know. None of us do. We are all going to be worm food, right? Um, and one day the sun will blink out and none of it will matter. We should be doing what we're doing because we need to look at ourselves in the mirror every morning. We should be doing what we're doing because it's the right thing to do and for no other motivation at all, right? And, and that actually is helpful in a weird sort of way because it really doesn't matter in the long run, right? The cosmos does not care what we're doing here on planet Earth. We're actually fucking it up, you know, so I hope they're not even watching, you know. But um, the fact is, is that we, um, you know, because it doesn't matter, it is some solace to me to know that the only reason I need to be doing this is because I have to look at myself in the mirror every morning. All right, so again, this is, this is just meant to be a useful tool to you. As some of you folks know who've been to previous Superpods, you know that I have spoken before on policy and like how the laws work and how regulations work and how the federal government interacts with state governments and so on. So my talks tend to be very pragmatic. I'm a very pragmatic person. This is still a commission now. Um, so this is just... Um, uh, uh, the paper itself actually sort of um, summarizes the film, and I'm not going to do that here because some other folks will be doing that, and also you all watched it last night, and others of us have watched it 25 times, and, um, and we all know what was in the film and why it was made. Uh, you know, a, a trainer was killed, and then we find out another trainer was killed only nine weeks earlier, and it just generated a firestorm of uh, attention to this issue that I, who've been doing this for 25 years, have no clue why. Um, this was a perfect storm, and I'm really not sure why. I'm not, um, I mean, I'm really grateful for it, but to this day, eight years after Don Branchu was killed, I still don't know why. So everybody knows, of course, that this is Tilcom. He um, was held in, at SeaWorld Orlando. I took this photo from the, from the Space Needle sort of thing that's there, the sky beam. And, um, the one thing about uh, sort of the immediate impact after this killing occurred that I wanted to mention, as a, again, as a pragmatic um, element, is that there was, a, there was a citation issued by the Occupational Safety and Health Administration um, that found SeaWorld basically guilty of neglig negligence for not keeping their employees safe. And as the ocean inspector put it, no employee should go to work and die. And so, you know, a citation was issued. <coughs> the tactical error, the most profound error that Siebold made at that point was they sued 
the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, the federal government, to try to overturn that citation. You know, just from a, again, pragmatic standpoint, they should have just sucked it up and lived with it because it was only a $75,000 fine. That's chump change for them, even today. And, and so why did they do that? Well, they did it because they couldn't let the citation stand. They couldn't let it stand that they were guilty of, of anything, let alone negligence. And so they made this huge tactical error of suing the federal government to try to overturn that citation. citation. And as everybody knows um, who has ever been involved in any kind of lawsuit, there's a process called discovery. And that's why SeaWorld stayed out of court all those other years. Whenever a, a trainer, some of the former trainers here would know, uh, might sue for an injury, they settled out of court. And it's because they did not want discovery. And so for some strange, stupid reason, they went ahead and sued OSHA over this citation, and discovery is what killed them. All, right. All this documentation that we had suspected existed and occasionally knew existed because somebody snuck a brown paper envelope out of the park, we found out it was true. You know, they really did cover things up, and they really were um, doing severe inbreeding with mothers and sons. And, I mean, all sorts of horrible things came out during discovery from their perspective. From our perspective, it was a treasure trove. So right after that um, uh, incident and, and during the hearing, both Gabriella Copperthwaite and David Kirby were, were moving in parallel to write Death at SeaWorld and create Blackfish. And the book came out first because, you know, post-production takes a while. Um, but then nobody reads anymore. So unfortunately, it didn't have quite the impact that we all wanted it to have. But then Gabriella released Blackfish and everything changed. And I'll tell you when it changed. It wasn't at Sundance, it wasn't in the film festival circuit, it wasn't when it was released in the theaters, it was when CNN aired it. Yes. And millions of people saw it. All right. By the end of 2013, 21 million people at least had seen Blackfish. Then it went on to Netflix, and you can ask your grocery store clerk and she'll go, oh yeah, I saw Blackfish. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, that's what was really effective and different about the Blackfish Effect. But again, as somebody who's actually witnessed pre-Blackfish Effect and post-Blackfish Effect and have been, has been deeply involved in the issues ever since, um, <laughs> well, not since God was born, but you know, a long time ago. <laughs> um, this is different. And for anybody who thinks things are going fast enough, oh, they're going way fast, okay? At least in the West, and then some folks are going to talk more about what's going on in the East, and there's some documentary film crews here who are very interested in what's happening in the East, Russia and China, and, and that's a different story, and it's one that I think is uh, potentially more hopeful than you might think, um, but nevertheless, um, what I'm talking about is what's happening in the West. Right. So, uh, one of the things about Blackfish that I think was really important, and you all kind of are aware of this and on some level or other is, you know, uh, of course SeaWorld claimed it was completely, you know, fake news before <laughs> fake news was fake news, right? They claimed it was, uh, you know, a, 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 just a bunch of lies and they put out a 69-point document about 69 ways it was lying and, and they, they, they mounted an entire uh, campaign uh, social media campaign, public relations campaign, to prove it was lying. But they never sued for libel. And in fact, it was having a material impact on their, on their economic outlook. And they're now in trouble because they tried to claim that it didn't. And there's a Securities and Exchange Commission investigation and lawsuits from shareholders because in fact they knew very well it was having an impact on their financial outlook. But they were arguing during this phase, right after the movie came out, that it was all lies, and that was why they weren't sued, you know, and that was, you know, why they should have sued, but they didn't. And it's because, in fact, it wasn't a bunch of lies. And Gabriella Copperthwaite defended her film very, very ably. And, um, in fact, uh, we go into one really solid example of how it wasn't a bunch of lies, which is the whole um, annual, more, um, annual survivorship rate, survivor, uh, longevity debate. I mean, it was very careful um, to uh, include, Gabrielle as a director was very careful to include quotes from her, many interviewees uh, that you know, indicated these animals really do live longer in the wild, they really don't live as long in captivity, um, and, and again, SeaWorld had no basis. You, your defense against a libel lawsuit is the truth. 
<laughs> if you're telling the truth, you aren't committing libel, even if you are harming the financial outlook of, of a company or something like that. And so they never did sue um, because they would have lost. And so, again, you know, when you present that to the SeaWorld supporters, they brush you off, but it's really quite an incontrovertible fact that they never, they never pursued this course. So, there you go. Wow. Yay. Now, notice David, David mentioned that, you know, there's been this uptick, but, it, you know, look at, it's not that big of an uptick. Um, they're still half, at half of their um, top level. They were at like $39 soon after their IPO, and they're still only around the 20 to $22 mark. And it's going up and down more because of the stock market going up and down than because of anything SeaWorld is actually doing, just so you know. There are some um, indications that uh, because they committed not to breed these animals anymore and because they're changing the show over the course of time across three parks, um, that there may be some people returning, but not in any big numbers. This uptick in their stock is not because of that. It's really just because the stock market temporarily, mind you, is doing better. Um, but really, they're not truly recovering in any significant way. This is, this is a reflection of their value, of, of, of how much they're worth. You know, they were worth this much, and now they're worth half of what they were worth. So even if there's some uptick, it's, it's not impressive. Right. Incidentally, I just thought one of the, um, uh, a friend, uh, colleague, uh, responded to the paper that SeaWorld published. Um, Jeff Entry mentioned it during his um, uh, talk, uh, introductions to all of us in the last couple of days. Um, they published a paper in response to the paper that John, Jet, and Jeff published. Um, they, uh, you know, John and Jeff looked at it from a slightly different angle. They used slightly different te techniques and they demonstrated that although there's been some improvement in survivorship and captivity, the, the, it's not impressive, and when you look at uh, milestones that they achieve, like sexual maturity and menopause, it's really not impressive. And so they sent a spy to uh, Superpod, um, we all met him, and, um, <laughs> and he sent back that, the presentation that was made here, and there was a request for confidentiality, and uh, a year before it was actually published, and they busily got to work, and it, it shows how rushed their prep was, because they got people who didn't know anything about what they were doing to write it, SeaWorld staff, to do the writing, a veterinarian, what does he know about statistics sort of thing, and, and then they rushed it because they wanted to get it out at least at the same time as um, John and Jeff's paper was going to come out, and essentially what happened was, and this is the way to look at it, because it's actually a very bad paper and it never should have gotten through peer review, but it's out there, we have to deal with it. So this is how I recommend you refer to it if you have to. And I, I cite it in my publications now in this context. What that paper showed, this is the SeaWorld paper on longevity, what that paper showed is that SeaWorld whales in concrete tanks are surviving just as well as the whales out in the Salish Sea. David just described to you that, that they're not doing very well, are they? They're critically endangered. They're starving. That's nothing to write home about. So that's how I recommend that you refer to it. Congratulations, SeaWorld! Your whales are surviving just as long as an endangered and threatened population of whales. Yay! You know, and they don't see that. They don't get that. They literally said, our whales are surviving as well as whales in the wild. The whales they were comparing them to are these critically endangered whales. And the threatened whales up in the northern resident community. And it's nothing to write home about. So, I think, oh yeah, still on this slide. Companies like Southwest Airlines ended their long-term par partnerships. Sports teams like the Miami Dolphins stopped connecting themselves with um, SeaWorld. Attendance, revenue, stock all dropped. Uh, there's the lawsuits I mentioned earlier. These are all the economic impacts on the company and on the industry because some of this stuff was starting to spill over into some of the other marine theme parks and dolphinariums, not just in the United States, but in Europe. The Western world was seeing a blackfish effect and it was uh, a heightened awareness of the controversy right? because everybody was seeing blackfish. And for a lot of those people, they thought the controversy started in 2013, which is kind of charming, but, um, or even 2010 when the trainer was killed. And like I said, that 
That always amuses me since I've been doing this for 25 years, but the fact is, is that they were aware for the first time on a very broad scale. In 2012, this is an interesting blackfish effect because it's more subtle and yet more obvious. In 2012, the Georgia Aquarium applied for an import permit for 18 wild-caught belugas from Russia. It's the first time a uh, dolphinarium in the United States was asking to import uh, wild-caught cetaceans from abroad in 20 years. Right? For 20 years, they'd stayed away from wild captures in US waters and from imports of wild-caught whales because they recognized that that was a line that the public wasn't comfortable with them crossing anymore. After the horrible controversy of what happened in 1976 here in Puget Sound with that capture that resulted in the state prohibition on captures, and the controversy of the final capture in the United States, which was in 1993, of some Pacific white-sided dolphins off the coast of California, and one of the dolphins died within 15 months in the facility it had been placed in. That controversy really um, made it untenable for facilities to use wild-caught animals. They had to breed them in, on their own. They had to you know, start a breeding program that was successful because that was the only way they were gonna replace animals that died without alienating their customer base. So for the first time in 20 years, right in the middle of the, black, uh, the sort of pre-blackfish effect, post-dawn, all right, George Aquarium, in partnership with SeaWorld and the Shedd Aquarium, decides to try to import these wild-caught belugas. Up until that point, 2012, the U.S. government had never denied a public display permit. Never. Not since 1973, when public display permits were required, until 2012. Any time a facility had applied for a permit to import an animal, any time a public display per, um, uh, facility had applied for a uh, permit to capture an animal, they were granted. Now, some of those were granted illegally. The government breaks its own laws all the time. That's why we sue the government all the time, because they're always breaking their own laws. So some of those permits were illegal, and the NGO, the non-governmental organizations, sued for, uh, sued when those permits were issued, and sometimes they won and sometimes they lost, but sometimes they won. So it's not that they were always legal to issue those permits, it's just that the federal government had no political will to deny them. If they were gonna get sued, they wanted to be sued by us than by the industry because the industry was more powerful politically and gave them more grief, right? So the permit application went in in 2012, but Blackfish came out in 2013, and the decision to deny the very first public display permit ever was made post-Blackfish. And I firmly believe, again, as a witness, as a witness of 25 years, that was a Blackfish effect. They felt for the first time that they had political cover to weather any lawsuit the industry levied against them if they denied the permit. And they did, because again, Georgia Aquarium sued. Right? They did exactly what the federal government had always been fearful of. They sued the federal government to um, overturn the denial. And I don't know if any of you are very interested in reading judges' rulings, but I urge you to read the judges' rulings in the Georgia Aquarium case, because it's a thing of beauty and a joy forever. It's very short, it's only 24 pages, which, trust me, is short for judges' ruling. And it's full of maritime analogies. She quotes Herman Melville, and she basically eviscerates every argument that the Georgia Aquarium offered. And basically said, you guys have got to be kidding me. I mean, it, it, you know, reading between the lines. Because seriously, it was, it was a comical argument. You know, and again, I urge you to read the ruling, I'm not gonna get into it here, but they did not do well. Right. Legislative and regulatory proposals started coming fast and furious. And again, from somebody who does this for a living, this pace was unprecedented. And then, lo and behold, even more mind-boggling, um, this is actually the federal bill, which is based on the California bill. And as you all know, the California bill actually passed. It is now illegal to breed, import, or export orcas in the state of California. The animals that are in San Diego will be the last generation ever held there, not because of company policy, which is the case at the moment all across the country for SeaWorld. They've made a company policy not to breed them, not to bring in any more, not to export any. But company policy can change, right? 
Joe Mamby is out, Joe Riley is in. So they've already changed their executive level you know, staffing. So the fact is, is that a new CEO or a new board or even the old board could change co corporate policy overnight. But the law is the law. So the fact that this bill passed in California, they can't get out of that one. They might be able to do something, I think, without, they can't really without losing customers, but they might um, in Texas or Florida, but they're locked in in California. I couldn't even have imagined this in 1999, say. All right, a few years into my career doing this. That wasn't even a hope of mine on the horizon. I was working toward better regulations and maybe something happening abroad. Like we were work, you know, working in Central America where Costa Rica, for example, prohibits all public display of cetaceans. I, I could see those sorts of victories, but I couldn't see this. This is a blackfish effect, absolutely. Now we have the federal bill, um, which is still alive, but you know, just imagine in this Congress it's not going. Um, but it's alive. We have S203 here, uh, just a, a north of us in Canada. We have um, initiatives in the European Union, so regulatory initiatives. So these are things that are happening post-Blackfish, all Blackfish effect. Legislators are finally taking it seriously, look at it that way. We're not the fringe anymore, we're in the mainstream. This is my favorite example of the blackfish effect. Um, one thing I left out was the fact that it actually started affecting, the, the impact of blackfish actually started affecting popular media. Um, one example, which you'll hear about later, is the whole um, way that Finding Dory's storyline changed. And that this is part of that. But what is very funny here, did, have y'all seen that? Mm -hmm. Do you know how many people actually believe that they did that? <laughs> Please, please recognize satire when you see it. Um, but this is The Onion, and The Onion just started doing SeaWorld stories left, right, and center. There's been more than a half a dozen, I think. Not quite a dozen, but a lot, like 10 or something like that. Hilarious. Burlesque. Uh, one has an orca you know, jumping out of the water, wearing a burlesque, like French can-can outfit, you know, and this is the new show. And um, uh, By the way, some folks thought that was real, too. Um, so, John Oliver, John Stewart, Stephen Colbert, Trevor Noah now, they do SeaWorld jokes all the time. And once you become the butt of a joke, when your reputation is built on mom and apple pie and expertise and we're the source of all things educational and research and conservation, uh, you're kind of losing it. You're, and, and this is how I, I usually... Um, characterize it, my analogy is, SeaWorld had the mic for 45 years, and we couldn't get the mic away from them no matter how hard we tried. We were literally shouting with no amplification on the fringes of the stage, at best. Not only did SeaWorld drop the mic in their response to Blackfish, because they just did such a poor PR job, but they threw it to us. <laughs> they gave it to us. And now we have the mic. We are the mainstream. They're on the fringe. And then, of course, SeaWorld actually, as a corporate policy matter, agreed to end the breeding of their orcas, which means that in the three parks in the U.S., if they don't change their corporate policy, uh, the animals that are in captivity now are the last generation. And they will, within 30 years or so, say, not have these animals anymore, and their business model will actually have to shift a bit because it's based on Shamu. The icon of their, of their corporation is a, is a dorsal fin. So we'll see, you know, uh, whether they change their corporate policy now that Joe Manby's out, and of course, HSUS, their partner, the Humane Society of the United States, also got caught up in the Me Too movement, and the executive level there has changed as well. So we'll see what happens when you know, time passes, but at the moment, it's still the case. It is um, the reason, and Ingrid will get into this, that SeaWorld abandoned their whales in Tenerife, you know, at Loropaque, because Wolfgang Kiesling just wouldn't toe the line. He bred Morgan, he wouldn't stop, and they couldn't get him to. <laughs> Be careful who you get in bed with or make deals with, for God's sake. Um, and that was a deal made between August Bush and Wolfgang Kiesling of Loro Parque. And August Bush, of course, is long since gone, 2007, 2008. 
right? So they couldn't get him to, to, to do what the cor new corporate policy said. And so instead of repatriating their whales, which they had every legal right to do, they dumped them. And I really think that's a line of advocacy that we need to pursue a little bit more. We need to shame them for abandoning their animals to a park that really is not good, you know, and, and a system um, in Spain which is really quite corrupt. And a man who's really quite megalomaniacal, you know, I think we really need to uh, push that a little bit more. I'm not quite sure how yet, but, you know, think about that when you're doing your advocacy. SeaWorld, how could you abandon your children, you know, in, in, in Spain? So, this is sort of the new, um, more palatable uh, approach that some of us are taking. It's a bit frustrating for some activists, I think, to see us doing this, but I have to um, urge you to do what is possible, not, as what, not what you want, ideally, but what you can achieve practically. And again, I'm a very pragmatic person. So I, I'm telling you, this is an argument that even wins over skeptical politicians. We're not asking them to end captivity today or even tomorrow. They can have 20, 30, 40 years to transition into a new business model. Just no more. What they have, they have to work with what they have until they age and die. And the last one, like the Vancouver Aquarium, when that last white-sided dolphin dies, they're done. And again, that's their decision. It's not the law yet in Canada. But they could live with that. Well, John Nightingale couldn't, he's retired, but, <laughs> but the Vancouver Aquarium Board could live with that. All right, we'll just keep displaying them until they're all gone. We won't replace them, we won't bring in any more, and that not only gives them time, but it saves face. They don't look quite like they completely cave to the crazy activists, right? <laughs> Politics is the art of the possible. Don't make the perfect the enemy of the good, please. Yeah. Right. That's how we're making so much progress because enough of us aren't doing that. We are going with the good and we're making a lot of progress. And so what's the solution for those animals who are still in captivity and they're not gonna be replaced when they die and that's great for the future whales and dolphins, but how do we help the current whales and dolphins? The Kiskas and the Lolitas and the uh, Corkies, how do we do that? Well, I, I'm, again, a very pragmatic person, and I'm sorry to depress you, but for some of them, we will not be able to do that. They're gonna die in a box. Just wrap your head around that, because again, to stay in this for the long haul, you have to be realistic. You have to, you know, take the bad with the good and, and, and not burn out, right? But we are also working on that. We're doing our very best to come up with viable solutions for the welfare of the current generation so that they don't have to die in a box. And I'm not going to get into great detail because Lori will talk about this and, and others will talk about this, but, you know, sanctuaries, sanctuaries, sanctuaries. Yes. And there are many projects right now, at least five that I'm aware of and a few that are a little bit more obscure but may, may make progress, that, so at least eight, I think, that are, are on the books right now, are, are in the drawing room, um, the drawing uh, table stage or, in fact, are moving forward quite rapidly in, in one case. So um, if we get any sanctuary, anywhere, online, successfully, I think, you know, if you build it, they will come. I think the, the pace will pick up. But for now, we're still working on getting one up and running and successfully. If one gets up and running and is unsuccessful, make no mistake, it'll, it'll retard the progress a little bit, but it won't stop it. So don't despair if something gets up and running and totally blows it, which, by the way, is possible. Um, we'll just have to cope with that. I'm all about, you know, dealing with the uh, fallout of, of mistakes. You know, we, we have to always be prepared to do that. It's not always going to work out the way we want to. But some of these projects are very viable, and they will succeed. And then we can move forward even more rapidly after that. And again, just, just be aware that we're not going to be able to save them all. As you may be aware, marine land in Ontario has 58 belugas now. That was the bumper crop birth, this, uh, birth season this year. And they, I think seven belugas were born all at once kind of thing. Eight, there you go. So there's, there, unless, um, there's way too many belugas in marine land. Um, 
there's always too many bugs at any place, but seriously, 58 is ludicrous. And John Holler just passed away, just died, and what does that all mean? We don't know yet. We might not be able to save all of those belugas. We're certainly not gonna be able to save all the animals in China. Again, I'm not gonna get into that because some others will. But let's see how that works out. I'm, I'm really hopeful. And uh, that's it, I'm done. So thank you very much.